I'd actually spoken to most of you anyway, already, but I'm Glenn Conway, if you don't know me, I'm the library manager. And so one of, one of the things we're trying to do with the library is to expand what we do, apart from just lend books and do the obvious. Um, and Scott's come along this morning to, well, well he'll, he'll tell you what he's going to do himself, <laughs> but he's far better than me, but the general, from the library point of view, of what we are trying to do, which is to expand what we do within the limitations that we've got. We can't have a coffee shop and we can't do other things, but we're looking at this you know, try and bring a little bit of extra. So Scott's going to talk about the Rich Listed Coffee Project and also his um, best selling, I'll say this because he's too modest, <laughs> um, oh. best selling book came out just before Christmas, sold more copies than the QI annual or something. Um, and uh, we're not selling. <laughs> but we, we're there to have a look at them. If you'd like one, if, if you'd like one, if you would like to take one, then you'd be very, very welcome. We oh, do thank you very much. <laughs> then you'd be very, very welcome to take one. So I'll uh, hand over to Scott and he can introduce what we're going to do. And, um, and uh, on behalf of the library, Scott, thanks for coming along. You're very, very welcome. Also, I have to doubt that Scott is also a nice chump. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know. I won't say any arm twisting, but at least... Uh, <laughs> it's important in history to make sure that you show any p potential yes, issues of subjectivity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the politicians would say... Always I'm declaring it. Yeah. <laughs> right, Scott, thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for <coughs> coming along, uh, everyone. As, as Graham said, this is uh, a kind of an experiment, really, to, <laughs> to try something with, with the History Pod podcast. Um, a podcast, is, is anyone familiar with the, with the concept of a podcast? So it's, it's basically an audio recording uh, that comes out digitally, it's uploaded to the internet uh, by, by anyone, really. I mean, the, B the BBC produce their own and you hear it getting plugged all the time, but um, anyone with a microphone and, and an internet connection can create a podcast. It's just an audio recording. You put it onto the internet and then people can subscribe to it, just like you would do to a newspaper or a magazine. And uh, any time that a new edition or a new issue or episode of the podcast is released, then it gets automatically downloaded onto your computer or you can go along and, and listen to it at will. And the podcast has been around for about 10 years or so, and they're starting to get quite a following. Uh, I started doing podcasts about 10 years ago. Uh, I'm a history teacher kind of by trade. Uh, I, I teach <coughs> secondary students currently in in Romania in a British school out there and uh, when I was teaching in the UK just as this new thing called the iPod came out there was there was a real problem for for teachers in that uh, you know students were constantly wanting to listen to things on their iPod uh, and uh, and all these students started getting them and they'd get on the bus in the morning to go to school or get on the bus in the afternoon to go back from school and they put in their headphones and they listen to whatever it was that they were listening to. So I thought, well, let's basically sleep with the enemy here. Let's try to get something useful out of this new technology. I didn't know about the concept of podcasts, but I did know about being able to record audio and put it onto this little digital device. So I started to make uh, revision recordings, just as revision notes for my students. Very quickly, they started sharing them, not only between themselves, but also with people from other schools, and it became, in, in, the, in the current parlance, viral. Uh, that this, this idea of giving students revision materials in another format worked. You know, they were able to still look cool on the bus by listening to their iPod, whilst at the same time actually getting something useful out of it. And I've been running uh, revision podcasts for the better part of 10 years, I think it's 12 years actually. The first one was quite a mess, I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> Um, so that so that was that. Uh, the thing that, that I find, particularly with, with being a, a history teacher teaching in, in the British system, is that despite you know various minor changes ultimately to to curriculum content, you know what should we learn, there is not very very much expansion beyond Henry and Hitler. That's, that's kind of, you know, a, a sort of an archetypal view as to what is taught. It's Tudor, Stuart, and then the rise of the dictators. But, of course, there's lots and lots of other things in world history that take place. 
that, that actually had an effect on these things or have been affected by these other things. And for my own interest, I decided that I wanted to broaden my knowledge of, of world history and try to explore some slightly less well-known aspects of the past. I thought that it would be useful for me and also an interesting project. So I set myself this challenge uh, in April 2015 of researching and writing 700 uh, characters, so about 260 words, about the causes, the course, and the consequences of an event that happened that day in history. And that is what History Pod is. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's basically a three minute summary of something that happened this day in history. Today's episode, for example, uh, which went out this morning, is all about uh, the, uh, I'll, I'll just refer to my notes because um, as, as was mentioned, I'm, I'm trying to, to live stream this. So there are some people who subscribe to my podcast who are watching me on the, on the phone up there, which is a bit weird. <laughs> but the, the event that, that came up uh, today was all about Pablo Escobar. Okay, now I'm sure that we've, we, we know about Escobar. He's uh, probably the world's best known uh, drug smuggler. And uh, on this day in uh, two, in, where are they? Yes, there we go. On this day, uh, 17 years ago, he escaped from prison for his final time. Now this prison that Escobar had uh, was built to his own specifications. He was, he was that influential uh, within Colombia that he was able to negotiate a plea bargain with, uh, with the government that basically said, yes, I will go to jail for the crimes that you claim that I have committed, as long as, number one, I get to design my own prison, and secondly, you don't extradite me to the United States, because I know that they've really got it in for me. Because Escobar had basically created the cocaine craze in, in, the, in the 1980s. I mean, this was a guy who devised incredibly clever ways to, drug, to, to smuggle drugs into the States. Things such as, um, like he'd, he'd dissolve cocaine in water and then wash genes in this solution, then ship the genes into America, which at the other end, people would then wash the genes out and the cocaine would come out. You know, things like that, you know, he's, he's a, quite, quite, quite a smart man. It made him incredibly rich. Uh, and America understandably wanted to get this guy. Um, Colombia knew that he was so powerful that there was very little that they could do, so they, they reached this plea bargain with him. So he built his own prison, uh, which had a tennis court and a swimming pool and, you know, big screen TVs and all of this kind of stuff. He was even able to choose his own guards. And, uh, <laughs> and although he stayed within the prison, he, he, he adhered to the terms of, of, of that. Uh, we know that he was visited numerous times by other wanted criminals because he was still operating his drugs empire from within this prison. Eventually, having been lent on by the American government so much, Colombia decided that they needed to get this guy and put him into a, into a proper prison. Uh, but Escobar, because of his contacts, he knew what was coming. So while his own guards fought against government uh, special forces that were sent in, he escaped. So he escaped from, it was called La Catedral. He escaped from his cathedral. Uh, his cathedral prison and went on the run for 16 months uh, hiding in various places and eventually he was captured just two miles away from this prison that he, that he had built uh, where he was shot and, and killed. That was ultimately the only way that they were going to be able to stop Escobar which was by killing him. So anyway 17 years ago today Pablo Escobar escaped prison a prison that he had built himself and then stacked himself uh, <laughs> So, so it's that kind of thing that, that, that I look at. It's what exactly happened? What, what are the origins of this? What, what happened during that event and what were the consequences? Well, the consequences for the Pablo Escobar thing was that actually cocaine use just increased because other people moved in and they just took over the system that was already running. Uh, his kids, interestingly, uh, they, they are now very famous in their own right. His daughter's a singer. Uh, his son is... Uh, footballer and 
an author, apparently, and a rapper. And he, he's a bit less famous, he's got a lot of money. <laughs> so, and he can pretty much do whatever he wants with it. Um, but why was it that I decided to focus on Matty Bell today? What, what was it about that that struck me as, as being a, an event worthy of talking about on the podcast for three minutes over some other things? Um, well, this all comes down to something that we refer to as historical significance. Okay? This is the idea that history and the past are very, very different things. Okay? The past is just stuff that happened. History is the interpretation of those things by people, could be at the time, or people later, who identify those events in the past that they think are worthy of remembering in some way recording them, commenting on them, uh, publishing them, whatever it might be. So there is a difference between the past and history. History is simply the events of the past that are deemed worthy of remembering. And clearly there are some things that will be remembered that, while there are others that won't. And my challenge is to decide, well, which of the things that have been remembered are most worthy of me picking up on for three minutes. And uh, th there is a problem with this because I set myself a, a, a kind of a project whilst doing this event to try and expand my own knowledge, which meant trying to go outside of the things that I already knew about. And this, I think, is, is the problem with history as it stands at the moment, particularly in the age of, of internet that we're in and, and the, the buzz speeding of history and you know people click and share on Facebook or whatever it might be that these tiny little bits of history get lost amongst the headlines of here's 10 things you didn't know about the First World War and it's well, the reality is that it's probably the same 10 things that someone shared the week before and so the same stories keep getting repeated and repeated and repeated to the detriment of pretty much everything else that ever happened in the past that's my view of it anyway and that's not to say that the things that keep getting repeated are not worthy of being repeated, but it's trying to say that there are, there are other things that happen as well, there are other events that can shed just as much light on the past as perhaps the more famous things. Now clearly we know about the assassination of Archduke <coughs> Franz Ferdinand. You know, this was the spark that started the First World War, and yet the assassination itself is arguably not the most important bit of what happened. It was the July crisis that followed for the next six weeks. It was this diplomatic wrangling between the various powers of the world and what Serbia was doing and, and the way that Austria was responding. And that's actually something that I'll be talking about in a little bit because tomorrow is the anniversary. Um, so we'll be, we'll be talking about that in, in a little bit. Um, but then there are other smaller stories that I think help to shed uh, light um, on the world that we live in, whether it's about the American nuclear missile tracking station that decided to start giving a fix on Santa Claus on Christmas Eve. You may have come across this. Mm -hmm. okay, but it's, it, why, why, why on earth? did? Because this was an American nuclear tracking station that started to do this. The story behind it is that uh, a local supermarket had set up this thing where kids could phone up Santa Claus and they misprinted the phone number. So instead of phoning the supermarket and you know the three people sitting by the phone ready to talk to them as Santa Claus, they ended up phoning a nuclear missile tracking station. <laughs> <laughs> and these calls kept coming in and in and in and in until the person in charge said, oh, just tell them where it is. And the amount of positive press that they got off the back of this, this was the height of the Cold War, they started doing it in 1952 the amount of positive press that they got off the back of it, they kept it going. And, you know, it's still going now. Uh, so, you know, that's a story that I think is, is something that does actually impact our world today and helps us to understand a bit of the Cold War as well, because it shows that, you know, the Cold War was, was all about goodies and baddies. And, well, our guys must be the goodies because they're on Santa's side. And so there's, there's a lot of social history that starts mixing with political history that comes in through these things, or, or I, I like to, to dispute some uh, urban myths as well. So in a week's time, it's going to be the anniversary of uh, Dom Perignon's supposed invention of champagne. He didn't invent champagne, sorry folks, he, he, he just didn't. He was a monk who was actually trying to not 
invent champagne. <laughs> In, in, the, in the, the late medieval period, one of the greatest problems for, for vintners was exploding bottles. And so what he was looking at was a way to stop carbonisation within the bottle. He wanted to stop the bubbles. Uh, that's what he was working on. Uh, but he did invent something very important for champagne, which was getting white wine out of red grapes. So there is a little bit of truth in the idea of Dom Perignon, but certainly not the one that the company spent uh, in order to, to sell their champagne. So I think that those those little events, you know, they're a little bit interesting, a bit sort of Stephen Fry Hugh-ish. It's like, oh yeah, that's that's quite interesting. But it relates to things that we know about in the wider world and it helps to shed that little bit of light onto a period of history that maybe doesn't receive the focus that it normally would. Uh, the analogy that, that I use with my students is it's a little bit like closing the curtains in a room, but you can still just make out the shapes of something. These are not the big glaring, wide open sunlight, spotlight type events. They're just the little chinks of light that make it through and enable you to pick out other little features of the past. And that's what I think these, these events often are. Uh, to give you an example of, of, of something that's a bit like that, um, Graham mentioned earlier, uh, my book. Uh, if you would like a copy, <laughs> then I've got those two here, and I'd be very happy uh, for you to buy one. Sorry. Oh, there's another one. There. Oh, and there's another one. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, you, you can you can get it from from bookshops for for thirteen pounds. If you do want to take a copy, then uh, you know ten or something. I don't know. Uh, I'm not very good at doing this stuff. Um, but when I launched this book, as I said, I, I, I live and work in Romania. And I was very, very lucky to be able to launch this book in an English language bookshop in Bucharest. Now, the bookshop itself is called the Anthony Frost English Bookshop. And ever since I moved to Bucharest, I was thinking, well, who on earth is Anthony Frost? I know he's not an author, or if he is, he's not one that I've heard of, or is he, is he a poet? Is he a reviewer? Who is this guy? And it turns out that he's a truck driver, or was a, a truck driver. I should say. Anthony Frost was a British truck driver. He was actually one of the drivers who led the very first convoys of aid that went from Britain to Romania after the fall of Ceausescu. Um, he started working on the convoy on Boxing Day, 1989, so the day after Ceausescu had been executed, and began driving early in New Year 1990, made it over to Romania. And, uh, and delivered the various things that Britain was sending over in the early 90s over to Romania. That's all Anthony Frost was, he was just a truck driver. Um, but he met a guy called Vlad. I mean, this is Romania, you know, there's a lot of people called Vlad in Romania, believe it or not. Although Al Alexandra is, is probably the most popular name, and Bogdan, Bogdan's a big name too. Um, he met this guy called Vlad, who was fascinated by the Western world and uh, was starting to learn English. And 10 years later, he started the bookshop. And Vlad, who had stayed in touch with Tony, uh, decided to honor his friend and the way that he broke down this barrier between East and West by naming this bookshop after, after the trucker. So the Anthony Frost English bookshop was named after a British truck driver. Now, funnily enough, Anthony Frost does not feature in the history of the fall of Ceausescu and the communist regime in Romania. That story is not there. But actually, by featuring his name in the title of the bookshop, it encourages people to, to find out about this story. And so Anthony has become part of the history almost by accident that somebody else has decided that it was worthy of remembering. And so now this story is becoming quite big. You know, I, I, I like to share this story. I think it's a, it's a fascinating story to share that, that, that history is not just about the great statesmen and women. It's also about the little guy and the mm -hmm. little differences that people can make. And that this is how social history can have a massive impact or, or a, a reflection of political history. And that's something that, that I really like about trying to explore these other stories. Uh, but, but how then do I choose whether to do a big story or a little story? Well, in 1989, back to 1989 again, called the Berlin Wall, of course, in November. 
And earlier that year, an American musician called Billy Joel released a song called We Didn't Start the Fire. You may know this song. It's basically a big, long list of events uh, in, in roughly chronological order. Billy Joel was approaching his 40th birthday, and he says that his nephew uh, said, basically asked him, you're 40, what's happened in your lifetime? So he wrote a song about it. That's effectively what this is. And it's a big, long list of events, uh, of 120 events in this song. The first verse starts by going, Harry Truman, Doris Day, Red China, Johnny Ray, South Pacific, Walter Winfield, Joe DiMaggio, Joe McCarthy, Richard Nixon, Studebaker, Television, North Korea, South Korea, Marilyn Monroe. So within that first stanza of the song, he's moved from 1949 to just breaking into early 1951. And that's basically what this, is, what this song is, it's just a chronological <laughs> list of events. But as a history teacher, I find this really fascinating because Billy Joel has specifically chosen some events to include and consequently chosen some events to leave out. So the question is, well, why has he focused on some at the expense of, of others? And that's because he is exercising his judgment of historical significance. He is someone who is looking at the past and saying, this is worthy of remembering and this isn't. Billy Joel's song shows what uh, academics refer to as a cultural and geographical proximity. And this is simply that we are more inclined <coughs> to be interested by those events that are similar to our own experiences or similar to the world that we know about. You know, there is often this thing about, well, you know, why do we remember certain, uh, you know, it's, it's a sad case of the world at the moment, why is a fuss made over certain you know, attacks, whereas others are ignored, for example. And there is a case of geographical and cultural proximity that goes on with this, that when we feel a particular affi affiliation or affinity for a particular geographical area or a particular culture that people have, then we're more likely to pay attention to it because we reflect on that, well, that could be us, rather than it being a world that we're less familiar with. So what Billy Joel was doing in his song is effectively just exercising that. He was looking at these events that meant something to him. Well, he's American, and he grew up in the Bronx. He was really interested in sport and music. So it's not really any surprise that his song is going to feature predominantly American domestic events, a bit of art and culture and sport, interspersed with some worldwide global events that had an impact on him in some way as a young American growing up. So his judgment of historical significance is very personal. This song, if you, if you go home and take a listen to it, We Didn't Start the Fire is a very, very good history of events that happened during the Cold War. But it's important to remember that it's Billy Joel's history of events that happened during the Cold War. And that if you were to ask somebody else to come up with their 120 events that are worth remembering, the list is going to be very, very different. So historical significance is a personal judgment. It is something that when one person says this is worth remembering, somebody else is definitely going to say, no, it isn't. I've got something else that is more so. And I face this problem with history pod because while I'm trying to, uh, with my mission statement, trying to cover all world history and from all different types of cultures, I'm affected by my own judgments. Well, how do I judge whether something is worth remembering or not? Number one, it's going to be, am I interested by it? And that's something that I can't help. You know, I can't force myself to become interested in something just to, for the sake of the podcast. It's, it's, it's not going to work. Further to that uh, is my ability to judge is an event that I've never heard of before actually as significant as something that I have heard of? There's a practical issue here. If I'm going to do this podcast properly and, and make sure that it's factually accurate, then I've got to make sure that I've got my facts straight. And it's going to take a lot more effort to research something that I don't know about than to just double check my research on something that I do. So, uh, so that, that affects things. And uh, so in practice, it's therefore sometimes easier for me to just write about something that's connected to something that I already have some contextual knowledge of. 
playing into this idea of geographical and cultural proximity. So I already have some knowledge of this event, so I can see how that event might connect into it. I'm two years into doing the podcast. Fortunately, my knowledge is expanding a bit. So I'm, I'm able to get, and, and I was talking to Jane a couple of days ago, this idea that now that my podcast has been going for a couple of years, the events are getting a bit more obscure. And it's because I have kind of little contextual coat tapes to hang my knowledge onto. That I can, I can see how these things fit together and I'm starting to fill in the gaps. I sort of, you know, I've done a broad base coat for the first couple of years and now I can start to add little interesting details. But how does, how does one judge historical significance? Well, there was a guy called Jeffrey Parkinson who was a, a, he was a history teacher trainer in the 1980s and he suggested that these are the things that we do when we decide whether something is worth remembering or not. And it's, it's interesting to see whether, whether you agree with him or not. It says that it needs to be remarkable, first of all, and it must have been remarkable at the time. Basically, if people at the time didn't recognize an event happening or didn't write about it or remark on it in some way, then it's probably not historically significant. Well, I have a bit of an issue with that because there's many events that we, at the time, don't realize are gonna be as significant as they are later. You know, this is the benefit that we have of hindsight, ultimately. Uh, he says that it must have had a major effect on people, so it must have changed things massively at the time and have had an effect afterwards. And it must have affected a lot of people. He talks about the quantity of people that must have been affected by something as well. And that that, that, that impact needed to have endured. So the thing that I have a particular issue with that he claims that for something to be historically significant, uh, it still needs to be relevant to our lives today. <laughs> Well, that's a tricky one because there's lots and lots of things that we might say that this event is very important for us to remember, but can we feel an absolute connection with it now? Can we see how, for example, the rule of uh, Mary the First is relevant to what we're doing now? Well, we can, but we have to justify it. And um, that, that's, that's tricky sometimes, you know, ultimately that's what my job's about. <laughs> As a history teacher, I need to try and, ma try and make these things relevant to our students. So when I start talking about events uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, you'll see that I've got this microphone and computer and things set up. I'm gonna start recording a few episodes of my podcast, which will go onto the internet uh, throughout the next week. So if you want to go along to historypod.net, uh, you'll be able to listen to what I'm talking about but it will be a bit more clearer because all of my ums and errs and pauses and flubs that I'm bound to do will have been edited out <laughs> to make it sound like I really know what I'm talking about. Um, so the, there is an issue in terms of choosing the events that go in, but there's also the practicality of finding it because you know, I'm not a font of all knowledge. I don't know every single e event that went on. I, I have to rely on compendiums and things like that in order to get my list to the events that happened on that day in the first place. And there's a problem here because we, we start approaching the issue of, of calendars. Because obviously we, we operate on a Western Gregorian calendar, which has been in place since the 16th century, depending on where you are. Were you in a Catholic country or in a Protestant country? Protestant countries adopted this later because the Gregorian calendar was introduced by the Pope. So we've got problems in, in, in identifying particular dates. And because calendars are dominated by a Romano-Christian calendar, that means that calendars from other cultures that, that are not Romano-Christian are a lot harder to date, specifically or precisely. The whole point of my podcast is to say, on this day, on exactly this day, X number of years ago, this thing happened. It's no good me saying, at about this time, something might have taken place, but it could have been next week. I'm not really sure I'm going to talk about it anyway. That's not the point <coughs> of, of what I do. And so the podcast almost becomes self-selecting and self-narrowing because there's many things that, that we simply don't know what, uh, when, when it happened. If we take like, the pre-Islamic pre Arabian Peninsula, for example, uh, the Arabs uh, had a system of calendar 
even before Islam. But it was a lunar calendar. Islam. in dating it until 20 years after they said the start date was, because they date the start date to, um, to, the, to the moving of, of the Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Medina. That's the start date of the Islamic calendar, but they didn't set that date until 20 years after it happened. And that's all very well and good. They had a calendar. They could say, on this day of this month, this thing happened. But the months changed lengths very inconsistently because they were lunar months. And although there was trade between the Islamic world and the European world, which had a, a Roman calendar and was using the Julian calendar, a Christian calendar by this point, the two never really got tied together. It wasn't until the 12th century that anyone made any attempt to fix dates onto each other and to say, well, we can have these two different calendars, but we need to know exactly which date things are happening on, especially Very important for basically for reasons of trade. You know. It was only really with the growth of trade in the 12th and 13th centuries that these calendars started to get fixed. And so it makes it very, very difficult for me to, uh, to include an event that happened in the pre-Islamic world because we simply don't know which day it was. Even in the, in the Islamic world, using the Islamic calendar, it's tricky because they didn't try and cross-date these two calendars until four centuries after they started using them. And well, because they'd been using a lunar calendar, no one had really recorded, was it a 27, 28 or 29 day lunar month? No one had written that down. And so it was very, very difficult to backdate it. They did, but they did it using mathematics rather than observations of the moon. So for four centuries, we know that the Islamic calendar dates are not accurately mapped onto the Christian calendar dates. It only happens in the middle of the, the 12th century, really. So that's a problem with calendars. And then obviously, if we move further, further away, uh, it becomes even harder, especially to those places where Europe didn't have a, a trading history with. You know, we can't start mapping South American dates until the 15th and 16th centuries. That's the point at which it becomes accurate, because that's when the trade begins. So, so calendars are, 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 are difficult. But then it raises the question of, well, how can we be so precise about European dates? And that's all thanks to the Romans. You know, what, what have the Romans ever done for us? Well, the wine, Reg, don't forget the wine. And the roads, oh, of course, the roads, and calendars. Okay. You know, Julius Caesar and, and his adopted son Octavian, who became Emperor Augustus, they had such an influential impact on calendars that they even named dates after themselves. You know, Ju July and August are named after Julius Caesar and Augustus. This is why October, which is the 10th month, is actually Octo, which is the 8th. They inserted two extra months, you know, Novo, nine, but it's the 11th. They just inserted two more months in. This is why it's not linguistically accurate in our calendar. And Deca, December 10, is the 12th. Well, it's still two more then, because Julius Caesar and Augustus were clearly stage runners. Um, but why then can we, can we backdate stuff so accurately? Well, that's all to do with a Roman scholar. His name was Marcus Terentius Varro, and he did some backdating. He pinpointed the exact day that the city of Rome was built, which was the 21st of August, uh, sorry, the 21st of April, 753 BC. Yeah, and he did this in, in much the same way as, as people have, have tracked ancient Egyptian calendars, which is just by getting big lists of rulers. The, the Romans were fastidious record keepers, as indeed the ancient Egyptians were, and they recorded the date that somebody began their rule and the date that they ended it. So all that Varro did was just work backwards. He said, well, if they were the emperors and left dates until then, well, who did they take over from? And let's go back a bit more, and let's go back a bit more, until he found his way back to the 21st of April, 753 BC, which is apparently the day that the walls of Rome were built by this fictional guy, Romulus, who had been suckled by a she-wolf. <laughs> Doesn't really make sense, but nobody has come up with a better system, and so we're kind of stuck with it. I've got a friend who's, uh, who's, who's a, a historian of, of, of ancient 
of, of, of more modern, later antiquity, he was focuses on 4th and 5th century uh, Roman Empire stuff. And I said to him, is seriously nobody ever been able to come up with a better system? He said, no, they just haven't. And why would we need to? Especially since there was an archaeological dig on one of the hills around Rome about five or six years ago, which unearthed what they've now recognised to be the oldest earthworks of Rome, and it dates back to exactly the middle of the 8th century BC. Varro got it almost perfect just by doing this backdating of, of stuff. We know that it's not it's not exact, but it's, it's a pretty good go. But all of these factors influence the events that I end up talking about in the history class. Being able to tie to a particular date, then choosing, well, what's important? Well, what would be marked on at the time? What still seems to have some effect on us nowadays? Are we talking about an impact on a lot of people or not? And then, of course, my own interests and things like that. I desperately try to keep it broad but uh, you know, history is subjective. As much as historians claim that they're objective, they're not. <laughs> Which is why you've got to use multiple sources to do this stuff. I, I have a rule that I will only write a podcast if I can find five sources on it as well. And that can be difficult because I don't have an endless library at home. This is where the internet starts to come into its own actually, into its own. Because you can search journal articles and things like that. Anyway. Bit of a long explanation uh, and, and, a, and a fair bit of, of reasonably heavy historiography. Now, I'm going to step in front of this microphone because we're going to start doing some live recordings, um, which are, as I said, are, are going to be coming out uh, a little later this month. Uh, this week, in fact, in terms of the podcast and, and events that happened on this week in history. And you've got a choice about what you'd like. Um, I've got four lined up that we can do. Um, I'm aware that we're, we're aiming to finish in, in around about 20 minutes' time or so. So we'll see how many we can fit in. Uh, we could uh, do about the Austro-Hungarian ultimatum to Serbia following the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which is you know, quite heavy diplomatic wranglings that were actually the reason that the First World War ended up breaking out. So we could take a look at that. Or we could talk about the rediscovery of Machu Picchu uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, we've got Bob Dylan going electric at the Newport Folk Festival, <laughs> <laughs> which isn't when he's called Judas. <laughs> this, this happened a few months beforehand. The Manchester gig happened a bit later. And another one that I've, that I've got lined up, if, if you'd like, is the very first women's cricket match oh, no. uh, that took place. So do, do you have any preferences on, on any of those? Oh, it's your call. Well, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> Dylan? That was my initial match. The, 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 the cricket match. All right, well, we'll do those two. Uh, and then, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I will do Austria-Hungary because this is... Good stuff. It's very, very interesting to see sort of how it, how it went. Okay, so at this point, I, d I do start referring you to my gadgetry and effectively a script. So at this point, it turns into more of a reading. Uh, I hope that you're okay with that. But um, you know, I, I do have a tendency to fly off at tangents and do little asides. So <laughs> please don't be afraid. And similarly, if you've got any comments or questions about anything, then then do feel free to ask. Um, in fact, is there anything that I've spoken about previously you may completely disagree with my justifications for including you there. Or once I've done some of these, you might want to question why on earth I've spoken about it. But we'll start with Bob then. Okay. Does everybody else Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's Bob. Everyone loves Bob. Okay. So, hello and welcome to this special edition of History Pod that's being recorded at a live audience of interested antiquarians at the community library in the Lincolnshire <laughs> village of Rustington. An antiquarian means someone who's interested in history. <laughs> <laughs> that is the matter. You're being insulted. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> so, on the 25th of July 1965, American singer-songwriter Bob Dylan performed at the Newport Folk Festival with an electric band. His dramatic shift away from his traditional instruments of acoustic guitar and harmonica 
was said to have electrified one half of his audience and electrocuted the other. Dylan came into prominence in the early years of the 1960s with songs that chronicled the social situation in the USA at the time. Described as the spokesman of a generation by the media, he had released four acoustic albums in the first three years of his recording career, but in March 1965, Bringing the Door Back Home indicated a new direction for Dylan. While one side of the record maintained his acoustic roots, the other featured an electric backing band. Dylan's appearances at the Newport Folk Festival reflected his album releases. In 1963 and 1964, he'd been the poster boy of acoustic folk alongside female musician and on-off romantic partner Joan Baez. But on the night before his appearance at the 1965 festival, he decided to go electric. Gathering together a group of musicians from the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, he frantically rehearsed a short four-song set that was performed on the Sunday evening. It's interesting to know that he had done an acoustic set earlier in the day. He played for about 45 minutes earlier in the day, and he was told that he could have an extra 15 minutes at the end. Accounts of the performance and the crowd's reaction to it differ. While some claim that the crowd were hostile to Dylan appearing with an electric guitar, others say that the booing was a response to the short set and the poor quality sound system. Let's face it, this was a, a festival that was set up for folk music. It wasn't designed to be used for electric music, and so it, it was going to have sounded bad. Simple as that. Whatever the case, Dylan going electric marked a watershed moment for both the folk and rock music scenes. He did play some acoustic songs at other points in the festival, but it was the four electric songs and the audience's response to them that are best remembered. Over the next 12 months, Dylan released five singles, consisting entirely of electric songs, but audiences in the UK were still catching up on his earlier albums by the time that he and his electric band launched the British leg of their world tour in 1966. It was during a concert at Manchester Free Trade a number of years later, in which an offended Bob Dylan responds with the retort, I don't believe you, you're a liar. You can hear both the heckle and Dylan's response, and you can hear in his voice that he's quite upset by the claim. In a, 90, in a, two, I showed that one again. In a 2005 interview with radio presenter Andy Kershaw, the Cumbrian man who claimed to be the heckler said that his anger was not necessarily at Dylan going electric, but more that he did so with a performance, again, through a sound system that made it sound vastly inferior to the album that the songs had originally appeared on. This, of course, is very similar to many of the claims about the booing at the Newport Folk Festival. Many years later, Dylan himself was interviewed about his decision to go electric, and still angry about the way that he felt the audiences had treated him, he railed against the idea that his decision to play an electric guitar somehow equated to him betraying our Lord and delivering him up to be crucified. It's a fair comment. In hindsight, however, those four songs at Newport marked a seismic shift in popular music that's still evident today. Indeed, to mark the 50th anniversary of Dylan first going electric, the 2015 Newport Folk Festival arranged for the very guitar that Dylan played that night to return to the stage and recreate the set. Bob Dylan himself, however, chose not to appear. Uh, much like when he got his Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> <laughs> Nobel Peace Prize? Nobel Prize for Literature, I should say. So there you go. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? This idea of sound systems in the 1960s and, and whether they were really good. Yeah, they were. They <laughs> were. And I guess that's, that's, that's the challenge, because, you know, Bringing It All Back Home is an incredibly well-produced album. And to create that on stage, I mean, I've, I've saw Dylan do mm -hmm. play about 10 years ago. And he still can't play it properly now. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he's just one of those people that he, he has his off days. <laughs> yeah, they must thought we were lucky they got 40-odd output. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
especially in places of that size. Mm. You know, if you listen to the Woodstock recordings, which admittedly were coming four years after Dylan was doing it, you know, it's clear that the sound system wasn't really up to the size of the festival. And again, nothing was up to the size mm. of that. Well, it was, I mean, in the Beatles' first film, Page, you know, so they were playing in stadiums that were six foot the American football, but mm. they were under less than six foot. Yeah, it's the Shea Stadium thing. It's coming it's through the tannoy system. Yeah. 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 It, it then ra- I guess it raises the question of why, why are you going? Are you going to hear the music, or are you going to, to see the performance? <laughs> I don't go to scream. Because <laughs> I, I, I remember <laughs> no, that. Yeah. when I yeah. went to see the Beatles live, well, you just couldn't hear the music. No. <laughs> <laughs> screams. Yeah. And that's the thing. So, why is it to be in the same place? It's to be in the same place. Yeah. Just to see them. Well, it was. It was to go and worship at the feet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You hear the music anyway, so you could. So it didn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you heard enough to work out what they were playing. Mm-hmm. You just heard it in your head. Yeah. You played it so many times. Yeah, that's true. It created an atmosphere that you wouldn't get listening to anything else. Because as, as you've answered, like, I, sorry. No, I just want to add that supposedly why the Beatles stopped touring because mm. they couldn't hear themselves. Yeah, like, <laughs> what was the point? Yeah. But then the, the, the issue about quality is an interesting one because you know, I've, I've been to lots of concerts and some of the most disappointing ones are the ones where it's played so incredibly well that you might as well just be listening to the album yeah. because yeah. there is no performance. And I remember Cliff Richard a few years ago, there was one tour that he did where there was, was it two songs that he mined yeah. Mm-hmm. And and he came and, and he basically said, Yeah, I'm miming because people want to show. In yeah. these two I can dance. <laughs> you couldn't dance, it was really if you you know, I'm I'm at this point now where I can dance or I can sing, but I can't do both at the same time. So do you want the show? It's quite a distance. You just want me to stand there and big shit up in it. Well you went that much Yeah. <laughs> well I think it wasn't just the live shows though. I mean that that I've always been a Christian Shadows fan, but when the films came out in the early 60s, it was the same effect. You know, the film was on the screen, the cinema was packed, and there was girls painting in the aisles in the street. Yeah. You, know, you couldn't even watch the film because of the story going on. So, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there it was, yeah, because it was just to be there. To, to the yeah, the experience. Mm. Should we talk about something else that's a really interesting social experience, which is women's first cricket match? And, and how how cricket uh, is a, is was not a particularly respectable sport. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Hello and welcome to this special live edition of History Pod that's being recorded at the Community Library in Ruskington, an English village that dates back to pre Doomsday times. On the twenty sixth of July, seventeen forty five, the first ever women's cricket match was played on Gosden Common near Guildford in Surrey. The first definite reference to the sport of cricket dates back to the 17th of January 1597, in which a local coroner testified that he and his friends had played the game of cricket on an area of common land near Guildford as early as 1550. However, it wasn't recorded as being played by adults until 1611, when two men in Sussex were prosecuted for playing cricket on Sunday instead of going to church. In the same year, a definition of cricket appeared in a French-English bilingual dictionary by the English lexicographer Randall Cockgrave, in which it was described as a game for boys. Even renowned party pooper Oliver Cromwell is recorded as having played cricket in London in 1617, and despite, uh, sorry, and despite games and other entertainments suffering a decline during his rule of England less than half a century later, cricket was still permitted to be played. By the start of the 18th century, cricket had grown to be a major pastime in which local village and parish teams were joined by county teams. The growth of the sport led to the laws of cricket being codified for the first time in 1744, but at the time the bat looked more like a hockey stick with a curved bottom rather than the straight bat that we would associate with the sport today. Although there would have been some significant similarities with modern cricket, 
The first recorded women's cricket match in 1745 would therefore have had some major differences. The first female match itself was reported in the Reading Mercury newspaper and featured teams from the Surrey villages of Bramley and Hambledon. The newspaper made the point that all the players were dressed in all white, but that those from Bramley wore blue ribbons in their hair, while the Hambledon maids wore red. <laughs> Although the identities of the players are unknown, the final result, which saw the team from Hambledon beat Bramley with a score of 127 runs to 119, was recorded. Furthermore, the article highlighted that, and this is the straight quote from the newspaper, the girls bowled, battered, ran and caught as well as most men could do in that game. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Blame the Reading Mercury. <laughs> now, similar to the male equivalent, the majority of early women's cricket matches were local fixtures played in communities around Sussex, Hampshire and Surrey. The sport, by this point, was associated with heavy betting, so much so that the original Gaming Act of 1664 had to establish maximum limits for the amount that could be spent on a game of cricket. Mm -hmm. However, women's cricket quickly spread after the first game and gained a level of respectability in 1777 when Elizabeth Smith Stanley, the Countess of Derby, organised a match in which upper class women made up the two teams. Despite this clear growing popularity of women's cricket, the first official women's cricket club wasn't formed until a century later in 1887. Known as the White Heather Club, it was established in North Yorkshire and was followed three years later by the chronologically confusingly named Original English Lady Cricketers. Quite why they were original when they weren't, I've not been able to find out. A national organisation for women's cricket was eventually established in 1926, when the Women's Cricket Association was founded. Under its guidance, the England team played its first series of all-women test matches in Australia in 1934-35. The tour saw the visitors secure victories by enormous margins over their Antipodean opponents, just a few months after the English men's team had lost the Ashes. Oh. The most prominent woman on the English team during that tour was Myrtle McLaren, who scored the first century in women's test cricket during the second test. In light of her prowess, the Morning Post newspaper dedicated this short verse to her. What matter that we lost, mere nervy men, since England's women now play England's game? Wherefore, immortal wisdom, take your pen and write McLaren on the scroll of fame. It's a nice little story that isn't it? <laughs> so uh, let's get into some, some deep, dark, horrible political bits from the First World War then. <laughs> and uh, and we'll, we'll aim to do this as the last one then. We'll talk about it a bit after. The Georgian period? No, the well, First World War. First Yes, yeah, so that, that idea of the long 19th century and then mm. when does the 20th century mm. really begin? Because it arguably begins in the summer of 1914 because up until that point everything's still effectively no different to how it had been before. Mm. 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 Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's where we get my, my favourite period of history is, is that kind of late 19th century mm -hmm. German history, Bismarck and unification and the alliance systems and mm -hmm. all of this all kind of, was systems. there any way that this could have stopped or is it, was it really, you know, the, the, the small t Tory history of um, the history of great men and women and uh, when you look at Bismarck <laughs> you think <laughs> there's a guy who pretty much dictated the shape of European history. It is interesting though to, to go back to to what he was dealing with in 1815, the, the Congress of Vienna post post Napoleon. Uh, the Congress of Vienna is often blamed as as setting up this shape of Europe that that ultimately led to the First World War. Yet the Congress of Vienna was probably one of the most successful peace treaties. It avoided a European world war for an entire century, which is 
quite impressive when you bear in mind the number of wars mm. that have taken place before that. There hasn't been anything that involved more than three countries post post Napoleon un until the First World War possibly going back. Certainly not that was fought in Europe. You know, everything became proxy wars and mm -hmm. empire and things like that. But it's it's interesting to see that this thing where the Congress of Vienna is a terrible, terrible treaty. It, it did what it was meant to do. So anyway, that's that's one interpretation of it anyway. <laughs> Let's get on to uh, on to Austro Hungary then. So I'll do my boy over the intro again. Hello and welcome to this special edition of History Pod that's being recorded in front of a live audience in the Lincolnshire village of Ruskington. <laughs> On the 23rd of July 1914, Austria-Hungary issued an ultimatum to Serbia specifically designed to be rejected and to lead to war between the two countries. The ultimatum was delivered at 6pm by the Austro-Hungarian ambassador to Belgrade with a deadline of 48 hours within which the Serbian government had to respond. They accepted all but one of the numerous demands, which led Austria-Hungary to declare war three days later on the 28th of July. Austria-Hungary had been concerned about the growing power of Serbia in the region and the threat of pan-Slavism, and it was keen to find a way to weaken the Serb government and stop it taking over the southern Slavic populations of the northern Balkans. The government in Vienna was particularly concerned about the threat to Bosnia, which it had annexed in 1908, and which had acted as a rallying point for the nationalist movements of pan-Slavism. To the Austrian governments who favoured war, we now call them forts, of course, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand on the 28th of June was the perfect excuse to go on the offensive. The heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne had visited Sarajevo in an attempt to win support for the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Contrary to popular belief, his assassination by the Serbian nationalist Gavrilo Princip was not an angry response to the Austro-Hungary's government of the region, but rather an attempt to stifle the heir's more liberal approach to dealing with the Balkans. Basically, he was wanting to come up with a multi-governmental system under an umbrella of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He wanted to give them greater political rights. If that happened, pan-Slavism would have failed, Serbia would not have got back Bosnia. And so he needed to be got rid of because he was too liberal, ironically. Mm -hmm. Franz Ferdinand had publicly declared his intention to grant greater freedom to Slavs by introducing this federal system of government to ensure that the Bosnian Serbs would therefore continue to agitate for the end of Austro-Hungarian rule, the heir had to go. Austria-Hungary initially condemned the attack and only began preparations for a formal response after consulting with its closest ally, Germany. Kaiser Wilhelm II met with the Austro-Hungarian ambassador on the 5th of July and gave assurances that Germany would support any military action against Serbia in what is known as the Blank Check. To many historians now, this is seen almost as the smoking gun that Germany was agitating for war. Having secured the backing of the strongest land army in Europe, the Austro-Hungarian Crown Council began preparations to force a military conflict with Serbia. With the power of Germany behind them, they believed that they would be able to secure a swift victory before Serbia's powerful ally Russia was able to intervene. This also underlined the German uh, invasion plan, known as the Schlieffen Plan, in which an estimate was made that Russia would take up to three months to be able to mobilize a force large enough to take on Germany. Clearly, it was miscalculated. Hmm. The Crown Council decided that an ultimatum to Serbia containing unacceptable demands would be the best way to secure a war. This way, it would look like Serbia was actually causing the war by not adhering to the terms of the ultimatum. Having agreed the wording on the 19th of July, the terms were presented to Serbia on the 23rd. The Serbian government agreed to all but one at the end of the 48 hour deadline. The one point that they refused to accept would have allowed Austria permission to enter Serbia and conduct its own inquiry into the assassination of the Archduke. Clearly that would have threatened Serbian sovereignty. And so that was the one point that they refused to accept. Since Serbia refused to abide by all the points of the ultimatum, 
Austria-Hungary's Emperor Franz Joseph ordered mobilization. This response alarmed the other countries of Europe. In Britain, the government called for mediation, but this was rejected by Vienna on the private advice of Germany. Kaiser Wilhelm, meanwhile, publicly insisted that he was doing everything in his power to calm the situation. It's actually unclear whether Wilhelm was lying or whether he was simply not fully informed of all the backroom conversations that were taking place. Whatever the truth of the Kaiser's interventions, however, at 11 a.m. on the 28th of July, Emperor Franz Joseph signed the declaration of war against Serbia. It was then sent by telegram to the Serbian government in Belgrade 10 minutes later, making it the very first ever declaration of war to be communicated electronically. Although Austria-Hungary intended for the conflict to remain localised, the network of European alliances that had developed from the late 19th century, of course, soon saw it develop into the First World War. Fair bit of old political wrangling there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And yeah, this, uh, this idea of using an ultimatum as a way to force something out. I mean, this goes back to, to Bismarckian politics that um, you know, Bis Bismarck was always up for a fight, can't we? Um, but he, he always said that you should only declare war if the reasons for going to war will stand up to scrutiny later. And it still goes on today. Absolutely, and this, this is, got is we're always trying to find justification for war. Mm. And you know, Bismarck's advice is, if you think that your reasons for going to war are going to unravel, then don't do it, find another way to do it. What Bismarck did, and ultimately what Austria-Hungary copied the Bismarckian approach, was to force the other side to declare war on you because then you're acting in self-defense. I mean, Bismarck went to war three times uh, between 1962 and uh, between 1862 and 1866, and he never once declared war, even though he had caused the war on all three occasions. He had simply acted in such an unacceptable way to the other countries that they felt compelled to respond. <laughs> uh, very, very clever, politically clever, but also rather Machiavellian in his approach. Trouble is, politically, the people who made these decisions were not the ones who went out in fear and got killed. <coughs> That's it, isn't it? And four uh, people led from the front rows uh, from this point on, I guess, people led from the back and let other people get killed in the end. There was certainly that shift. I think Wellington put it very, very interestingly. You know, that Wellington, who, of course, is a <laughs> pretty, pretty major military leader, um, and defeated Napoleon and won Waterloo and all this kind of stuff, and then became a politician. And he once said that, that, that he didn't believe that any politician should ever declare war unless they themselves had fought in it. Mm. He said that the worst possible experience that you can ever have is needing to order people to go and fight. Mm. Um, and mm. Churchill said the same thing. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, these are people with experience of what it means to do it. Mm. And Certainly the nature of politics has shifted significantly mm -hmm. since then where you get career politicians. Mm -hmm. I wonder what an impact that is going to have on us to have done the state of world politics. Mm -hmm. That's to come. Yes, of course. Business man in the middle of the country. He's not averse to signing things, is he? <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's completely, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see, you know, technology. Like it's fishing, isn't it? Fishing, yeah. 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 It's, it's very dangerous, really. Mm. It's very, very dangerous of that scale. Yeah. It's bringing a new approach to politics, though, which we call the scale of the mm. It's mm. showing us that that has been a good thing. It's It's the way, I think, that, you know, that technology affects mm. things like this as well. You know, the, the First World War, jokingly said that you know, the First World War became so big because of railway timetables but because as soon as you start mobilising and you've moved one train to, to one place then every all of the other trains have to fit in and it's virtually impossible to stop them mm. and there is a large element of, of, of truth in that even though Thompson was, was joking about it when he said it 
as an example of how you can say that anything caused anything else. Uh, there, there is an element of truth in that. And then, of course, I said things get faster and faster and faster. The, the reason that I like including the thing about the telegram mm -hmm. being the declaration of war, mm -hmm. you know, a decision is made and it's communicated to a foreign country ten, within 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's coded, it's sent by, by Morse code, then it's deciphered and, and passed to the desk within 10 minutes. It doesn't allow that kind of cooling off period mm -hmm. to think through mm -hmm. you know, the potential repercussions. Exactly, and this is, this is where we end up with Cavotti and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> things like that. This seems to have been Sean Spicer's thing yesterday with his resignation saying, you've made a decision here and I don't think that you'd probably talk. Like you say, it's, it's changing the very nature of the house that you're working in. Mm. I declare on 170 characters. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> we are at war, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. The Chamberlain speech wasn't much longer, was it? No, absolutely. No. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, then you then start falling into, well, what exactly is it that determines a declaration of war? Because you don't have to say that you're doing that. But, you know, no, nobody's declared war for well, the best part of a century. You know, people just don't say, we are now at war anymore. Instead, they just start fighting in self defence. That's the, or, or you know, or, or, support, or on supporting. absolutely supporting somebody else, or, or because a revolution has been passed to do something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, to use force. military force. force. It's war. <laughs> yeah, Chamberlain. It's, uh, it's linguistics. Consequently, mm -hmm. a state of war now exists. Mm -hmm. That's not quite the same as saying that he declared yeah. war. Mm -hmm. You know, Hitler never did, Mussolini never did, mm -hmm. Stalin never did. Fascinating stuff. Anyway, thank you all so very, very much. Thank you. Hopefully you found that interesting. Really, I thought yeah. it's one of your, one of, yeah, and you asked this at the beginning about why do I choose these things. Mm -hmm. I thought was it's so relevant and so important mm -hmm. in any study of history. It's important to know which bits you're leaving out and why. Yeah. As, as much as which bits are you including and why. We just do pretend to read stuff and just accept it as truth, and, and I know so that's not necessarily, mm -hmm. you know, history is a movement. It's more difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What you were saying about, you know, the sources and whatever, because there's so much fake news and all this other mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. and how do you differentiate between the two? Because well, it's, it's, this is the quantity of material mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, one. one of litmus test for reliability of sources is well how many people are saying it and that's where fake news becomes a problem mm -hmm. because you yeah. know, the, 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 the yeah. litmus test is well if lots of people are saying something then it gives it more credence in, in terms yeah. of reliability yeah. Yeah. but it doesn't necessarily because where are they getting it from in the first place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know there are these fake news these fake news machines um, one village in Romania actually is dedicated at it um, it's just a style of headline that you can create and people start clicking on it mm. and then they click on the advert and, it's 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 <laughs> and that's basically how it runs yeah. that's what that's what they're doing there's <laughs> there's actually there's a, there's a couple of click farms that i was reading an article about on, on abc the australian uh, news service and they they did a, a kind of an investigation of this there was one company that was operating during the american election and they ran click farms for both sides in the election. So they had headlines that were going to get clicks from Democrats and headlines that were going to get clicks from Republicans. And it was the same story. And just by changing a few words about it, you managed to cause uproar in one side or the other. Um, very clever, mm. but quite terrifying. But it's, but it's so easy Is to that do that. Trump mm. got in, do you think? I'm not qualified to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that it's fair to say that the impact of social media and the immediacy of it mm. is, is quite significant. Mm. And, I mean, Trump himself would say that you know, his presence on Twitter is, in, in particular, mm. is incredibly important to, to kind of his brand and to, to what he's, he's able to do. Again, I know, you know using, using the Romanian example, 
for the, the, the presidential election two years ago, uh, and it was the very first time that somebody who wasn't from the Social Democratic Party ever got the presidency. And it's generally seen that that happens because there is a huge movement on social media from younger voters uh, to get out and, and, and do something. And I think that's where we're starting to see the impact. It's this this sense of immediacy that you know, when people are walking around with something in their pocket and they, you know, if it's buzzers or bings or whatever it does, and they reach it out and they're getting a message, it's just this constant barrage of, of instruction and information. And whether it's fake or real, that's that is I think where well where our all comes in. <laughs> you know, <laughs> librarians and historians and oh. teachers and you know, we trying to encourage people to be critical. Mm. Um, it then raises the debate of, well, how do you become critical? Because you can only start being critical once you've got knowledge of the thing that you're trying to be critical of. Mm. So it, it, it comes back to this issue of finding sources. But then if we're saying that you've got to critique the source first, then before you can get the knowledge, but you've got to have the knowledge to critique it, then, then it becomes really complicated. Well, my own sort of academic research, which has been actually in books, so long ago. But you know, you get a source in a book and you look in the reference and it was another book. So mm -hmm. by the the author says that's right, yeah. and that book get out and so and they have a look in there and it's another source. That's and right. eventually you've got five books and you're back where you started from because you know, the oh, latest edition right. of book one is mm -hmm. is close to the first edition of the one they think, well where did it start from? Well if you want to try and find the original yeah. source then yeah. 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 you want to try and get back and confirm but even then it was difficult. Because yeah. they kind of ruled everybody was quoting each other, and you couldn't mm. really get back to, you know, who was the where did the original bit of thought come There's from? There's a fascinating podcast actually that's done. It, it, so it's a radio show that comes out on the World Service, but they do it as a podcast. It lasts for ten minutes, and it looks at the statistics behind the headline. So whenever <coughs> a headline comes out, it says so and so percent of people, whatever, uh, and then they try to track the sources back to find out where it originally came from to see whether there's actually any credence to this, because in the age of the scoop, and especially a scoop which is an electronic scoop now, rather than a printed scoop. You know, you've got to get that story, check it, and get it straight back. The checking is, is I think, being lost in, in journalism. Mm -hmm. So people do see these statistics, they see that mm -hmm. there's a reference, that it's referencing something that seems academic, and they say, well, it must be true in the same and town. Everyone was on the standard, weren't they? Because you get to go to school and stuff. Um, <laughs> the papers being written, um, you get a journalist doesn't understand what he's reading or what she's reading um, you know and they would just quote what they think they yeah. read it's their interpretation and they, they've not really understood what's actually mm. being mm. told mm. and you just think it through and you can't mm. catch it how you've gone with it mm. and they haven't actually mm. I think mm. that's just mm. it has to be it's too obvious mm. Mm. I think the other thing is if you can find a you're only going to get supporting facts. You're not going to see opposing mm. facts. And to have a real picture, you've got to see both sides. Absolutely. And, he's yeah, and that's the problem. Tracking is trying to track it back. And yeah. hen hence, you end up with a, a, a great example, I think, is, is the history of Richard III. Because <laughs> for centuries, everybody's believed that you know, Richard III was, was hard done by, by, by you know, anti-Lancastrian Tudor propaganda that, oh, he was this horrible hunchback. And then, you know, they dig him up out of the car park <laughs> and <laughs> suddenly it's, oh, he did have a twisted spine. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe this wasn't all Tudor propaganda. Maybe they were taken. So, yeah. you know, all the history books have been rewritten. Yeah. You know, from what I was teaching five years ago, my textbooks are out of date because you've now got to start using a different type of, it's mm. this, this language of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. talk about it with my students it's how do you get across this idea that something might have may have probably possibly it's this is why historians annoy people I think because we don't always say this is what what happened but you can't say this is what happened and then you know because you, you just exactly until, until, until you, you see it as in you remember things differently yeah, yeah until, until you recognize it as interpretation 
because again, we want to reflect what you were saying. We reflect what is of significance to mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. and we remember what is of significance. And this yeah. is where the you know the confusion. We see, I see it a lot with 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 the students that I teach, but you know, in conversations in the club as well, the idea of called primary and secondary sources. Oh, primary sources must be more reliable because they were there at the time. Well, not not necessarily. They might have been looking in the wrong direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, if you find you could you can read sort of Montague Chronicles from 1066, but they weren't in Hastings, so they don't know anything about what went on. It's all hearsay. So mm -hmm. you've got to be very, very careful. It's interesting when you talk about calendars. I mean, we, we based our whole life on a calendar, on first, basically on the birth of Christ. And I've got, I've got a clue when it was. Absolutely. And there's no way of, 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 we know when the earth was formed because it, you know, it was all calculated back when who begat, who begat whatever, and it was like on the 10th of September, 4004 BC, you know, well, that's 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 when it's calculated. Yeah. This, is, this is why I talk about you know, the vagaries of calendars, that, you know, we have a, a, a fair idea, but calendars weren't necessary at, at the time. So, well, you know, when it's done by astronomical observation, There was a great documentary on BBC Four last week all about where unified time came from, basically linking it to you know, the creation of the railways. Because mm -hmm. until that point, every town was running its own clock, and everyone in the town just used that clock. But it might be different to the next town over, so you needed mm -hmm. to get a unified time system, hence mm -hmm. UTC. <coughs> unified well, time these code. days, when the sun's at the highest, that's yeah. all you need to know, isn't yeah. it? In fact, it's yeah. different time over there. You know, if your steam train's travelling faster than the sun goes across the sky, which it was, yeah. <laughs> that's a bit of a problem. <laughs> anyway, lots and lots yeah, of fun. Yeah. Well, I'm very, very much appreciate it. Half of the lively, and thanks, Ross. Yeah. Very, very well. Coming in, hope you just enjoyed it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.